people have asked, how much does it take to move a caboose? I probably have an hour's long talk to them. Just, okay, here's what you're going to need to do. Write this down. My name is Tom Bachman. This caboose, I acquired it in 2013. A number of people had seen it advertised in the paper and things like that and knew that I would be interested in a caboose uh, because I like just railroad type things. I have a model railroad in the basement and I collected some different outside things such as whistle posts and whatnot, but this is the first time I actually had a piece of railroad equipment. With the encouragement of another fellow who was into railroading and said that he would, oh, he would be able to help me, we decided to go ahead and purchase it. So when it came up for auction, I bid on it and turned out to be the highest bidder. Then we had to get this thing moved and set up. Unfortunately, it was February, which is probably one of the worst months to have to move a caboose. The frost that's in the ground, even though there was snow on the ground, the ground actually wasn't froze. So it was working in a mud bath. So it took quite a bit to get it to where they could support this caboose. We had to bring in 40 ton of limestone for this caboose to set on because the caboose weighs 44,000 pounds. But in the process, going down, working on it, you're working out in a weather that was anywhere from zero to six degrees above zero. In fact, as the day we moved the caboose, it was six degrees above zero. The 100 ton crane didn't want to start. So the moving company got it to start and we were able to make, finish making the move. There's a lot of logistics that's required to uh, be able to move a caboose. Because of its weight, you're going to have heavy weight permits. The state's going to tell you what roads you can bring it up on. You have to worry about your zoning, whether your Board of Appeals will even allow to have a caboose. So we ended up bringing it up and had a heavy moving company. They actually brought it up with four low boys and a 100 ton crane and set it on the site where it is now. So as it kept going, as you kept tearing apart, you kept finding more and more and more things that were going to cause this to be more of a challenge. So this caboose was stripped down, clear down to the bare metal. Everything was redone from the ground up. Any caboose that's built back in the 1930s and 40s or beyond is going to have a lot of materials in it that no longer are materials to use when during a restoration. They use insulation, which is a, a combination of asbestos and, and also wool material. So you had to be very careful how you were taking it out, how you dealt with it. You have to use a lot of respirator, a lot of goggles to keep this stuff from getting around, and you do it slowly. It's actually best with one or two people working slowly to keep the dust, all that kind of contaminants down. As we walked into it, the roof had a lot of problems because over the years it had been neglected. So where the seams came together in the metal roof, they had started to rot out. So this wood, had, that translated to coming down to in, the inside of the caboose, which rotted wood in a lot of places. All the wood was saved to be able to try to use it over when it became time to put the caboose back together. But when it actually did become time to put it together, we were only able to save enough for the ceiling. The rest of the wood just had that much damage, warpage, rotten, whatever it was. There's actually three floors in this caboose. And as it was being taken apart, you were going down through all three floors. And of course, the water going into the floor as well had rotted the floor. You buy a two before today, it's not actually a two before. It's actually been shrunk down. Back in 1937, a two before was pretty close to a two before and it was going to be a hodgepodge, a piecemeal up and down, trying to get the floor to be level. It was better to just remove the whole floor and start over. Every wind in this caboose, except for the one end of the door, has been replaced. The side windows all had to be replaced. They were made out of wood, they were rotten. The end windows all had to be made, and they were out of vinyl. When I ended up putting together the insulation, okay, I wanted to be able to be able to be here in the wintertime, as well as the summertime, and be comfortable inside. So we put one inch styrofoam was put on the inside after all the body work was done. And there was a tremendous amount of body work before I get into the insulation. When water gets underneath a metal seam in the winter time, it will, what they call jacking, it pushes out the seam. In some places, the seam might be out always on the side seam an inch. I had to come back, put those all back into place, get them all pushed back in, and then to keep from having a future problem with water jacking, I drizzled fiberglass in every seam and put it together. 
So this way water could no longer get down in there and would actually be able to preserve the caboose and keep that water jacking from occurring. Part of my deal with the township was the caboose could not be permanently hooked up to sewer water electric. So what we've done is we've run out just like an RV. If I want water in the caboose, I connect it just like an RV. Same way with the electric. I was a welder by trade, so welding was not an issue. I had done enough with carpentry work and enough with electrical work that pretty much there's the only thing that I had outside help on this caboose was actually putting in the heating and air conditioning. Everything else was all done. I did it. All of the insulation, like I say, it's one inch styrofoam behind. Since I wasn't able to use some of the wood that was originally on the caboose, I went to eight inch tongue and groove pine. So that was put in here to make it simulate the type of walls that have been in it before. The lighting I tried to simulate, which some of the lights that were in cabooses at that time, Aladdin built the lights. When they built the lights, and they stopped building them in the mid 50s. So parts and pieces are harder to find. There are some stores that have them, but trying to get them, but get the caboose mount. When the train would go to take off, it would actually, when it starts, there's actually a jerking sensation. If you have a light with a wick in it, you could actually spill it, whatever. These lights are made with a movable hinge. So what happens is, is that will uh, be able to take the cushion, cushions out all of the fracture that might happen. This is where the stove used to sit. When they had a big stove that was inside here, they would have it that was their heat inside a caboose, and then it went up through to the chimney on the top, which is on the roof. An oil tank used to be mounted inside here that would hold the oil, uh, and then that was an oil furnace that worked that way. Every closet door had to be rebuilt. Every door had to be rebuilt. The doors were uh, totally rotten. It came apart. So I had to actually build in every, every door, put on, put them together, and build them in. All of, in the cupola area, this is where the brakeman sat a lot of times. He could look, sitting looking out of those windows, he could see over the top of the train. This was before they ever had radios. So if he looked ahead and saw that there was smoke coming from a car up there, might be a hot wheel, he could actually go back here and the conductor could turn this valve and actually could stop the train without being able with no radio. As he turned this, it would take him, start to relieve the air and set up the brakes. And when he totally went to emergency, it would release all the brakes and be just like putting on the full air and the train would stop. So in the caboose, the conductor could actually stop the train from the rear. When they made an ice cream caboose, these had all been cut out because they had microwaves, cooking ovens, all kinds of things in here. So I had to go back, weld these pieces all back in. When they were doing the ice cream caboose, they cut a four by four hole in the ceiling and dropped the equipment in through the ceiling. When it came time for them to take it out, they did it again, opened up the hole and took it out. They didn't seal it correctly and water was just pouring into the top of the cupola running down the sides and causing all, a lot of the water jacking, the rotting of the wood. So that all had to be sealed up before I could even start on the caboose to get this thing back into position. When we would seal up holes in here, we would find things that were left over that weren't, uh, that were necessarily railroad, but we'd have to clean all that out. I had to patch a number of holes. At one time, this used to have a bunk. These are the holes where the bunks used to latch. When it was in the down position, it was latched here. When it went up into the up position for storage, it went into the upper hole. So they actually had bunks that went up. This thing would sleep two, one on each side, because those same square holes are on each side. You could actually lay someone on the bunk. So now you could have four people sleeping back here if you really wanted to, crew members to move them along. The old bathroom used to sit here in this little corner. It was a very, very narrow corner. Because my agreement was not to have a bathroom anyway, we opted not to even put it in. This door here, I had to totally replace this door. It was a wooden door that had been, it was totally rotted out. So we had fabricated a new door and put this one in. A lot of people would ask why a caboose is green, because all cabooses are supposed to be red. Well, not always the case, because Union Pacifics are yellow. Other ones had various colors as well. 
However, the reason this one is green, originally when it was built in 1937, Lehigh Valley had it mainly as boxcar red, the red color that they would normally use. When the Penn Central merger occurred in 1968, these cabooses decided to use what they called pool service. In other words, they could take caboose from one railroad to another railroad and use it. Well, the Penn Central colors were Penn Central green. So this was one of 12 cabooses that were painted into Penn Central green to be able to be used. Trying to even find out the number of this caboose was interesting. When the process of taking it apart, I had found green parts and pieces which said at one time this was green. But because the caboose does not have a serial number, no one knew. And there were six missing Lehigh Valley cabooses. They knew they possibly existed. They did not know the numbers of them. When the government in 1973 decided to make create Conrail, it got painted blue. But Conrail sold off a lot of the cabooses when the caboose era was ending. This caboose ended up in Akron at Akron Sandblast, and they sandblasted off. I was able to find a person who took a picture of it. And when they found the picture, we had the Conrail number. When we took the Conrail number and moved it over to the Lehigh Valley number, it turned out it was one of the six missing Lehigh Valley cabooses. There were two of them that were missing that were green. It was one of the two that was green. I had a company here in North Canton that actually does paint for the Wheeling Lake Erie, different railroads like that. They mashed it up for me, and this is actually in Emron, just as what's being put on the new equipment today. When I was looking for this caboose and trying to find the number, because now that we know it's 95056, when I looked at pictures of it, I'm like, no, this can't be, because now I can find green painted 95056, but there were different parts that were different. And I'm like, Am I, do I have the right caboose? This, Conrail put this on, it's stamped right in the coupler of 1976. Well, that's when all this happened to be taking place when Conrail came over. This is the old mount where the old Lehigh Valley coupler was. They used high mount with a high pool out the top. When Conrail moved it over to it, they moved them to low mount. So there was a difference there. It kept confusing me till I was able to try to find to figure out, oh, here's the changes the Conrail had made. Something else about the windows that probably a lot of people didn't know is back in the 1930s, they did not have the silicones, the caulking that we use now. All your windows were sealed in with lead. And in the process of trying to meld out the paint from around the window rivets, things like this, I started noticing that I was getting silver streaks. What in the world could this be? I got to looking at it, it was lead. And actually the warmth of my torch to meld off the paint from the, in order to get it ready to be sandblasted, was melting. So you had to go a different way of burning the paint off to keep it so that you would not melt the lead out. These cabooses also, were made in 1937, had what they know as Birdsboro trucks. This particular caboose actually retained its Birdsboro trucks. Some cases they would need rebuilding and they might put a, cup, a truck under from another uh, railroad car or something like that. This caboose never had its trucks changed. Alongside here, you'll find these, there's one on each side. What that is is where they would plug in when it got to a railroad yard, they could plug in and recharge the batteries that were inside. Those closets inside actually held batteries on each side and what they would do is they would have to recharge them so that they were ready for the next trip so that they'd have their lighting on the inside or anything like that that they had to run off of off of a battery these steps you can see where we had to what i talked about previously they had cut them off when they had moved it with a low boy at one time when i got it here i had to, i had these bottoms refabricated and then i welded them back on again when we got it up here in, in position so that it had everything looking as much original as possible. When you do this or ever get into a project like this, there are certain crafts that you would have to be able to uh, be able to work with, unless you have lots of money and can afford to pay someone to come and do all that work. The fellow who said he was going to help me, unfortunately, the same year that he started to help me, he passed away. So now it was me, the Lone Ranger, putting the caboose together. Many days you'll feel like, okay, I'm, this is way too much, but just keep on going at it. And every day got out here and kept on working with it. It's been a life experience. I mean, I would, I would never say that I wouldn't want to do it now that it's done. It's been a tremendous experience. Seeing the people that have gone through that have never seen a caboose before, you actually be able to get through a caboose and get up close to a caboose. 
people call and say, hey, can we come down and go through your caboose? In Christmas time, it's lit up for Christmas. Uh, different graduations or people want to get a family photograph will come down and take a picture. And that's, that's what it's here for. It was a long trip, but I'm glad it finally is over. Other than the fact that now I have to figure out what I'm going to put inside and I've looked at different uh, possibilities there. So uh, that's, but the fact that it's closed up, it's where it is, that's a great satisfaction. Every time you pick up a piece of lumber, the dollar signs go off every time, everything else. So, but it's like anything else. It's in the satisfaction and I know that you got it done. People say how much you got in it, so it doesn't matter. It's how much I enjoy it and enjoy having other people enjoy it as well.